We're going to hear from a gentleman who's going to talk about taste and the importance that taste has in evolution. So, Mr. McQuaid, please. This is yummy. Fantastic. Hello. Um, let's see. I might get this. Okay, that's me. Yeah, here we go. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just start with the paleo diet, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It's uh, an attempt to return the diet to something that it was at the time that uh, humans emerged, and the idea is that this is healthier, and obviously this paleo diet is much better than the not paleo diet on, on the right. Um, However, this paleo diet is really sort of a modern construct. It's a little bit uh, cartoonish, um, you know. Um, I, I want to ask you to think about it in a, a slightly different way. I'm going to look at a few real paleo diets and kind of what they meant, and specifically at uh, the role that culinary craft has in human evolution. Um, essentially, taste is, we usually think of it as a, kind of a chemical reaction on the tongue, but it's very complicated. It engages all different parts of the body, the gut, of course, uh, the brain, cognitive functions, hormones, basic primitive drives, all of these things are involved. And so when you think about it, uh, cooking, the ability to manipulate food has, uh, is basically artistry applied to biology. We literally use art to manipulate our biology. And throughout our past, this has been uh, crucial in our evolution, in our changing biology. And this was true millions of years ago, and it's true today. Um, so I'd like you to think, um, you know, what are some of the forces that are acting on you as you eat that cannoli. Um, you know, why do you like it or dislike it? I assume you like it, but um, is it evolution? Is it genes? Is it uh, culinary artistry, which obviously very important, or corporations, you know, that make the basic ingredients, or is chance uh, playing a role there too? So. Let's go back about two million years. Um, this kid um, is uh, Matthew Berger. He's the son of a paleontologist. In 2008, he was at a dig in South Africa, and he stumbled over a, this rock, which contained the bone of uh, this guy, uh, Australopithecus sediba, uh, a two million year old fossil. Now, this is a time when uh, Australopithecines are starting to walk upright. Uh, human Ancestors are starting to use tools. They're starting to travel distances across the savanna. And they analyzed the diet of, of the, these creatures by scraping their teeth, uh, as you might do in a police procedural, um, and just looking at the residue and analyzing. And they found something very mysterious, which was that uh, they were eating a forest diet, a very unappetizing diet uh, of bark, uh, nuts, some berries, you know, really kind of hard, <laughs> you know, might damage your teeth kind of food, not very enjoyable food. Uh, at the same time, kind of food that was looking to the past. Um, forest food, food that apes were eating, not the food of the future out in the savanna, meat or grasses or other things that later become much more important. So um, uh, the question is, how do you get from the bark and nut diet to what we have today. Obviously, uh, there's a big difference. Something big, big happens in between these two things. You know, the food we eat today, very diverse in flavor, in color, <laughs> in texture, in the, uh, what the ingredients are and the amount of time it takes to make them. So what, what was happening there? Um, obviously, a couple things, and these illustrations are not, uh, not really ideal, but uh, one thing that happens is hunting. Humans develop uh, tools, uh, weapons. They can uh, go and kill an animal, which takes planning and uh, sophistication, and also fire. People learn how to control fire and to use it to cook. Um, and this is just an incredible innovation. I want you to just imagine what that must be like, because cooked food tastes so much better, obviously, than raw food. So they're creating the best tasting food that any creature has eaten in the entire history of life up to that time. Um, so you can imagine just how revelatory that, that must have been. Um, so let's go forward about a million years. This is a dig in Israel. 
um, which is uh, the, where the first uh, widely accepted evidence of cooking fires was found um, about 700,000 years ago to a million years. And these are not Homo sapiens, they're some unknown ancestor. Um, there's burnt flint shards, there is uh, olive uh, and a residue of olive and other things, uh, grains, fish that have been burnt, and there's a kitchen, so they're pounding things and cutting things and really putting a lot of effort into making a communal meal. Um, so obviously there's an extraordinary change that has taken place in, in this uh, period. And what is that change? People get taller, um, brains get much bigger, and this uh, physiognomy makes no sense. Um, uh, brains consume a lot of energy, humans have big brains, um, so a lot of energy there. We're walking upright, traveling long distances, a lot of energy there. Our guts are small, though, uh, compared to, say, our closest relative of the chimp. Our jaws are small. Um, so by rights, we should not be able to consume enough food to eat. So what makes the difference? And uh, my argument, which is a little bit, uh, I think, overlooked by biologists, is that good-tasting food makes a big difference, that being able to cook and manipulate food uh, makes the, this body and brain possible. Um, and so you have a virtuous circle developing um, where everything is reinforcing everything else. It's all kind of pointing back to food preparation and food tasting better and finding ways to craft it. Um, and so what happens in this? Um, I'll point out to two things which further enhance our appreciation of food. Um, the first is, uh, if you see on the right, the retronasal route. Um, this shrinks in the human head compared to other apes. And this has the effect of supercharging the aromatic component of flavor, which is very important. It's perhaps more important than taste. Uh, it makes flavors complicated and evocative. Um, and so that is something that exists in humans, doesn't quite exist in other animals whose senses of smell you know, point outward. Um, the other element, of course, is our big brain, particularly the frontal cortex, where we have cognitive capacity, we have language, we have abstract thought, and all of that has a big role in, to play in taste as well. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what are some of the implications of that? One of them is that we like stuff that animals don't like. We like stuff that tastes bad. Um, which is very biologically mysterious. I really didn't understand this even after studying it for a long time, writing a book about it. This is a coral, this is a uh, Icelandic uh, shark, um, which tastes like uh, and smells like a combination of ammonia and rotting fish. Um, and yet, you know, it's a, it's a delicacy in Iceland and uh, people eat it around the holidays. And uh, I can, you know, from personal experience, I can tell you it tastes really bad. And yet, you know, people embrace this contradiction. Uh, many cultures have this type of cuisine. Or in something more common, uh, you have espresso. Uh, if you divide an espresso shot into thirds, uh, you'll get different tastes in each one. And so there's a bitter, bitter third, a, a sour third, and a sweet third. Each of them tastes terrible apart. Yet if you put them together, they taste delicious. Um, at the same time, um, the uh, bitterness of it is also kind of off-putting. And so let's talk about bitterness. Um, I don't know, I have a video there. Can, can we get that video playing? I do not like broccoli. <laughs> and I haven't liked it since I was a little kid. And my mother made me eat it. And I'm president of the United States. And I'm not gonna eat any more broccoli. So, uh, <laughs> uh, President Bush famously denounced broccoli, and uh, some people, many people, are very sensitive to bitterness. And this is a genetic trait. Your genes program you to dislike bitterness, to be very sensitive, to have a heightened awareness of it, you know, when you taste it. Some people, like me, I'm relatively insensitive. I have a different genetic uh, background. Um, and uh, so, where does that come from? Well, part of it is uh, our exploration of the world once humans left Africa 50,000 to 100,000 years ago. 
and people traveled all around the world, and as they occupied different habitats and ate different foods, their genes, their sensitivity to bitterness was tuned in different ways. And so geographically, if you go to one place, you'll find a different uh, portion of the population is sensitive. Some places there are a lot of people, some places few. And this is fascinating. I don't think anyone's ever looked at how that affects uh, cuisine. Um, the other dimension to this, of course, is that humans are highly adaptable. And the ability to manipulate food um, and the ability to embrace stuff nobody likes are very advantageous if you want to explore the world. And so this, these factors enable people to go and live anywhere and eat almost anything because they have such mastery over food. Um, so we've covered, I don't know, uh, millions of years, and you'd think, well, the human form is more or less established, uh, so things are pretty much uh, plateau from this point, but that's not true. Uh, things keep changing. Our biology keeps changing. So, for example, when people uh, started herding cattle, uh, they went from being lactose intolerant, as most of the population was, to being lactose tolerant so they could digest milk. And this was a large genetic change that took place mainly in Europe, and this shows approximately the geographical location that was calculated doing genetic studies somewhere in Central Europe as the herdsmen moved west uh, about five to 10,000 years ago. So you can see those choices influence our biology. And of course, this also leads to the creation of cheese, uh, which is another uh, great craft, and fermentation, you know, where you leave out milk and it'll start to ferment and you'll get cheese and then you manipulate that. Um, alcohol fermentation as well, occurring around the same time. Uh, so civilization, which is getting off the ground at this point, is uh, changing flavors as well. The ability to manipulate microbes in fermentation really expands the flavors available. It makes them more complex, uh, you know, also makes it possible to get drunk on a regular basis. Um, and so all of these things really open up, once again, in a kind of revolutionary fashion, the sensory realms that people could not previously imagine. Um, then moving even further forward, um, uh, you have the ability to mass produce taste. And this is uh, sugar cane being cut in the 1800s. About 1600, sugar gets off the ground, you know, built on a you know, terrible human cost of, of uh, slavery, um, terrible conditions for hundreds of years. Um, all to serve, you know, the god of uh, the sweet taste. Um, and uh, because sweet taste is a very compelling thing. And this ability to mass produce something, obviously it makes cuisine sweeter uh, in Europe in particular and the Americas. Sweet cuisine becomes sweeter, desserts emerge as a thing, um, and tastes change. You know, people get used to this, they kind of like this sweetness. So, you can see that that also is having, as we see now with obesity and diabetes and other things, has a very negative effect on our biology. And uh, <coughs> this is a, uh, I thought it was an anti-slavery pamphlet, but it turned out to be a pro-sugar pamphlet against uh, tax, sugar taxes. So anyway, um, but just to give you a sense, um, pleasure is, is a primordial force in our behavior, and sugar is, uh, basically turns that on. And so you can see that uh, the, the cognitive, the, four, the um, frontal cortex is involved, but all other parts of the brain are involved, very primitive parts, signaling and the gut is involved. So you monkey around with that and you're gonna have a serious uh, problem. Um, and of course the other dimension of that is uh, advertising. Advertising works on the frontal cortex you know, all our uh, associations, our brand awareness, that also has an effect on the way things taste and our experience of them. So you have this biological uh, force uh, coming up from the bottom and you have this kind of cognitive force coming from the top that is manipulating how you feel. Um, so this more or less brings us up to the present and, you know, I wonder, what do you do, you know? Um, 
the, the best advice is to know where something comes from, to know what process or processes produced it. Is it an industrial process? What kind of industrial process? You know, where, what is the source? Um, that way you get a sense of the craft or the manipulated, manipulation elements to it and can make an informed choice about whether you want to be manipulated. Um, the next question is, looking forward, um, what's coming next? You know, the, these trends are accelerating, they're snowballing, you know. Two million years, probably, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of years would go by without too much changing, but now things are changing every decade. So I'll give you a couple of positive things just to leave you with a good feeling rather than a bad one. One is uh, chilly heat. Chili heat became a part of global cuisine only 500 years ago when Columbus brought it from the Americas to Europe and it rapidly spread around the world and changed you know, the way food tastes in a lot of places. Uh, lately, in the last uh, generation or so, there's been a kind of secondary wave, in, in largely in Western cuisine, where food gets hotter. You know, there are various uh, things behind it, you know, ethnic cuisine and others. But overall, uh, food is getting hotter, and the hottest peppers are getting extremely hot. Um, and nobody knows why, nobody knows why people like these things, but they do. Um, this is the uh, hottest pepper in the world, 1.6 million Scoville heat units. Um, it, that is three times hotter than the hottest pepper in the world was a decade ago. So it's like getting into the industrial uh, strength uh, uh, level there. Uh, this is my son, Matthew, after he tried uh, with the hottest pepper in the world. <laughs> um, people like it as a kind of, a, uh, you know, a kind of peak experience, you know, just to put, put, it, put your body to the test. And no one really understands the biology of it. Um, the other element of it is, uh, as we understand the DNA of microbes, we can decode how fermentation worked. Previously, a black box, you know, for tens of thousands of years it's been used, but no one really knew what it was doing. Um, and so this, uh, a lot of recipes and, you know, all the cultural accumulation produces a kind of narrow band of flavor. All the, f a lot more flavor lies outside of that band, and we're starting to explore it now. Uh, these are misos produced at Momofuku restaurant, their food lab in New York City. There's a pistachio and a pine nut miso, which are absolutely delicious. Uh, finally, there's, uh, is virtual taste possible? Um, I personally, I think it's inevitable. Um, obviously, all the other senses are pretty much accounted for in virtual reality, and they're starting to work on it in uh, taste as well. And of course, this is still very crude. You attach a clip to your tongue, and uh, it, it generates a, a sweet taste or a bitter taste or whatever, but think ahead in uh, t 10 years, 20 years, you'll be able to download a complete meal off the internet and somehow hook yourself into a device and experience that. Um, and what will that be like? Uh, you won't eat it, but you'll enjoy it. Uh, I don't, I'm not really sure I understand, but that's what's coming. And, at that point, I think people will be looking back at the Big Mac as a paleo diet. So anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>